Welcome to this uh, second video of the lecture three notes involving just some exercises from there. I'm going to very quickly, because we've actually done this, um, done both these exercises in class, talk about exercise 10.8 and 12.2, and I'm putting them together in this note uh, so that you can really see it. So in 10.8, we have an increasing sequence of positive numbers, Sn, and then we define basically this moving sample average. Uh, as we go down the sequence, Sn, as more terms come about, we just average them with all the previous terms to define this new sequence in terms of the averages of the first n terms in the sequence Sn. And then if Sn is increasing, what we have to prove is that the sigma n sequence of averages increases. And then that same type of averaging sequence is used in 1212, although there the sequence Sn is not considered to be increasing. It's just a sequence of non-negative numbers. And in this result, it, you know, I'm going to spend a little time actually talking about uh, this one before I go through the proofs, is you're asked to show that the limb inf of Sn bounds the limb inf of the averages, which is clearly bounded by the limb sup of the averages because there's that relationship between limb inf and limb sup, and that that itself, that limb sup of the sigma n's is bounded above by the limb sup of the Sn's. And then there's this kind of hint that looks maybe a little crazy and bizarre, but we went through why that's useful, and, and we'll get to that again. But I just want to actually discuss over here some consequences of part A. So one is that if the limb inf is positive infinity, well, then that implies immediately for one that the limb soup is positive infinity of Sn because the limb inf is bounds the limb soup by below. This certainly gives them that the limb inf of sigma n is positive infinity, and so is the limb soup because of the relationship of the bounds of limb inf and limb soup of sigma n. So that means the, the, li the limit of the sample average is positive infinity. And, and this is just also a consequence of part b, but you can see it immediately from part a. And so that's actually kind of uh, somewhat interesting because it kind of says if you have a sequence of non-negative numbers, but it diverges to positive infinity, then kind of no matter how slowly it diverges to positive infinity, there's no way that you can make the limit of the sample averages finite. That's kind of interesting because we certainly have examples of, you know, of functions that diverge to infinity like very slowly, like log of n. But that doesn't matter. If it, if it diverges to infinity, then eventually you're just averaging over enough terms that are sufficiently large to make the sample average arbitrarily large. Uh, another consequence is that if the limb soup is uh, finite, that's the second consequence here that I'm hi highlighting, then you actually have that the sample average um, is basically finite or that all the sample averages are finite and if the limit of them exists at all, it has to be finite. So basically if the sequence of terms that you're averaging over never goes off, never has terms that go off to infinity so that you can't have the limb soup be infinity, there's no way to make the sample average arbitrarily large, which is maybe completely obvious, but that's a consequence. And then finally, there's this third uh, uh, consequence that I wrote here and it kind of, I, I left it vague. It's if the limb inf is less than infinity, the implication is actually not clear. What happens when the limb inf is finite? So, you know, maybe in some sense, can we, this, this leads to this question that I wrote here, is can we have that the limb soup is positive infinity and maybe the limb inf is uh, finite and so that the sample averages actually end up having a finite limb soup? And I, I give you an example, something to consider. I'm not going to explain how this works, but I'll let you maybe try to figure it out. Here's the sequence Sn, and it's basically a sequence where the, the limb soup is infinity, because you'll notice there's the term one, there's the term two, there's the term three, four, five, and six. And I clearly have just embedded this sequence that diverges to infinity as a subsequence of Sn, and that makes the limb soup infinite. But I've padded this with zeros. I have one zero here, I have then two zeros, three zeros, four zeros, there's kind of a reason for that, because of how, I end up averaging the numbers in the sum. Maybe try to write out what the sigma n terms are corresponding to this number, and you'll see, oh, these sigma n terms maybe don't trail off to in infinity as well. So anyway, um, I actually, you know, have this all the scratch work and in, in the, these results for you know the exercise uh, twelve twelve and uh, for ten point eight. But um, I, 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 before I go into those, I, I just want to say. 
you know, this, this result right here, part B, the proof of it, we didn't talk about that in class, but it follows immediately from part A and theorem 11.8. So you should definitely go review those. Theorem 11.8 was, is, is a really important result. And so I want you to read that if it doesn't come to mind exactly what that is and how part A is just basically writing, the, this is the proof for part B. This result follows immediately from part A in theorem 11.8. That's the proof for part B. And I've also given this example um, for part C. And so I'm not gonna say a lot on it because you need to just look at it and kind of see, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's what's working. And maybe figure out why these terms are what they are. And once you, once you figure that out, it, it all makes sense. Um, so going back to 10.8, we have S ends in increasing sequence. We want these sample averages to be increasing. So the scratch work for that, I'm doing it here uh, a little differently than the way we did it in class. I'm not um, removing one of the denominators. It's, it's not necessary. I just like to do that to kind of clean up the work for myself. But I presented it here just with, again, I want to show that that difference of the n plus one term minus the nth term is greater than or equal to zero. You can refer to video one about why that shows it's an increase in sequence. And then I just go through, you know, basic work collecting like terms and, and it actually falls out pretty easily. You get left with a term like this and you say, well, if the SN was an increasing sequence, that term's gotta be greater than or equal to zero. That's kind of about it. And then in 12.12, exercise, uh, the part A of this exercise, one of the things that we talked about is why this hint is useful. And I just collected everything into this uh, one note very cleanly from what we presented on the board. So I'll, I'll leave you to, to read it very carefully, but I do want to point out one of the things that I'm doing before I pass to the limit, like when you establish a bound works, uh, you know, it's, it's tempting to say, well, I'll take the limit as n goes to infinity of both sides. Before you do that, you actually want to establish that the limits exist. And that's what this work is doing here. I'm basically saying, hey, I'm establishing, in fact, let me, it's, it's a little bit more precise. These steps are establishing that all the limits are defined as n goes to infinity. So then once I've done that on both sides of this inequality, I can take the limit as n goes to infinity. And then once I do that, I actually see, oh, this does create a bound of the limb soup of sigma n in terms of this term. And then I can say, well, what happens if I take the limit as n goes to infinity on both sides? And then I find again, all the limits are defined. And so I can take the limit as n goes to infinity and I can establish the bound, one of the bounds I'm after, in fact, you know, this, this specific one right here. This one follows immediately from other results in the relationship we have of limb and limb soup. So the only thing left to prove is that result, which we actually didn't do in class, or I mentioned it briefly, but I think I had a typo on the board when I thought back on it. And so I've cleaned it up here. And so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for you to read, but I'm basically using the same type of, um, you know, n is greater than or equal to m, capital M is greater than capital N from above. And I'm just showing, hey, uh, because the terms were non-zero, when I split up the sum, like I can just get rid of that one, it's greater than or equal to zero. And then I just replace this uh, term, specifically this particular sum with this inequality below by the infimum of, over all the terms. And then I have n of them that I'm adding here. So it's n times that sum. And uh, actually I have capital, I, I don't have quite n terms, but it's greater than or equal to this. Um, in fact, I could I can move to make it more precise. Maybe I should really move that term over there, and then then everything will work out just fine. So okay, I could be a little bit more precise about that. But at any rate, you get that it's greater than or equal to this inf, and then just like before, you can take limits as m goes to infinity and n goes to infinity. And I didn't do that here. So that's it. You should spend some time with these details. I've really cleaned them up for you though in, in, in these notes and have written them in a top-down way. So read through, hope you found some of this discussion uh, useful.